No, it doesn't matter. Okay. Relax. So I'm comfortable. Okay. Uh, to what extent do you think your family's point of view affect your artwork or your creativity? It's interesting uh, to have that question because feminism needs to be defined to make that question make sense. And for me, feminism is a complete transformation of society. And it has very little to do with just women alone. It has to do with a total change in the attitudes of everyone on earth, essentially. And I know this is probably, you know, not the, uh, it's probably not the popular view of feminism, what people think that means. But for me, that is what it is. And so, in essence, the work I'm doing is revolutionary. I'm interested in the total change of the attitude of everyone on earth so that it moves away from an attitude of separation, taking one person and separating one person from another, taking one race and separating that race from another, taking one nationality and separating. I don't want that. I want people to understand we live on one planet, we live together, and we must be considerate of each other. And this is called connectedness. That's why so many of my artworks are about connecting the people of the earth. And it's in its essence, it's a feminist concept. But feminism as a revolutionary concept in which everybody's attitude will change. Okay. Do you think that your earlier work about Mace is like a state of confusion about your career as a sculptor? Say it again. <laughs> Do you think that your earlier work about Mace is like your state of confusion about your career as a sculptor? Well, not really. Um, I've never been confused about my career. I started making art when I was three years old, like most children do. But I was lucky. I didn't stop making art. And uh, so I progressed all the way through grammar school, making art, winning prizes, winning art awards, all the way through college. I had a scholarship to Mount Holyoke College based on my artwork, interestingly enough, because that's a liberal arts college. As you know, it's sort of like a women's Harvard or something. And uh, all through my life, the artwork has won awards, and it's really been a career that started when I was three. I, that's the last time, that's when I can remember back to, I can remember drawing at that age. So uh, there was never any confusion about my career. But the mazes represent my searching. Uh, and I've done a lot of mazes. Uh, there's one right up there on the wall that was done in Massachusetts, snail shell maze. Those mazes represent my quest which is my search to find the way. I know in uh, Zen, the way is called Tao. And I have had uh, a very active search or quest going on in my life for a long, long time. I think since I was 19 or 18, I began to be conscious, even earlier, maybe 17, I began to be conscious I was not happy with the Protestant religion I grew up in, in New Orleans. And I started searching for another religious and philosophical attitude. So it began then. I was at Mount Holyoke then. You know, I was a freshman in college. And uh, it's never stopped, and it probably never will, because I learn something new every day. As a professional artist, do you feel a sculptor should take the environment into consideration? Oh, of course. Um, my sculpture really could be categorized as two groups lately. This is, say, all the sculpture I've built since 1983, or 80 even, could be categorized in two groups. And those two groups would be called meditative spaces, and that would include the mazes. It would include uh, a p piece in Philadelphia called Singing Rock Sitting Place. And it would include uh, the arbors. I've done a series of arbors, one of which is here in New York City in Canarsie at Ralph and Farragut in the center of Glenwood Houses. And all of these meditative spaces include the environment as an active part of them. The mazes are made with evergreen flowering plants, singing rock sitting places in the middle of Fairmont Park. And so the environment is totally integrated into the meditative spaces. And then the other section of my work is called connectors of the Earth's people. And essentially what that doing is considering the environment in an abstract way more than it's not just putting the plants and the earth and you know a meditative space as the work it's uh, 
asking people to think about our world, to think about our community as people, and to consider thinking of us as one unit. We are together. And so that is very much of an, a basic environmental concept. And it's why we, at this point, need something like Greenpeace, or why we need an ecology movement. Because people forget that if they throw litter over this shoulder, the person behind gets it in the face. They don't think of the continuity of everything in the circle of the Earth. So yes, it's very environmental. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, uh, what must an artist be aware of when creating a sculpture? Oh, what a big question. <laughs> uh, when I'm creating a sculpture, because the work I do is site-specific, in other words, I never create a sculpture here in my studio that then gets taken out to a plaza or a city place and put down. I always start with the place where I'm building it. I start with the site and I go there to the site and I photograph the site and I walk around the site and I measure the site. For, for my kind of work, it's these are the things that are important. I can't speak for the sculpture who makes what I call plunk art and takes something in the studio and plunks it somewhere. I don't do that. I measure the site, I walk around the space, I sense the space and this is a very important aspect of what I'm doing. And I've learned to trust my tuition, intuition about uh, the space. One of the things, the Chinese have a man who comes to a place when you're going to build a house. And the Chinese call the man the geomancer. And what he does is he tells you which way to face the front door of the house. But the way he knows how to put the front door of the house is because he has a very high level of intuition. He has a sensitivity beyond that of the normal person. That is why everyone goes to him and says, how do I face the house? Is this a good place for my building? When I'm building a sculpture, I use the same kind of intuition the geomancer uses. And I sit in the space. I meditate in the space, I watch the people, I watch the light, which way the shadows fall, which way the sun comes, and all of these elements then become my materials from the site, from the place. And then I go back to my studio with my photographs and measurements and all of these things, and then, like you see, these are the photographs of my new sculpture for Crete. When I have all of those photographs and measurements, then I become very quiet and I let the message come to me because what I found is that I may not be the one who's doing the sculpture. It may be a spirit which comes to me and it always comes as a complete drawing. When I decided to design this sculpture for Crete, I meditated at a friend's house on the north coast of Crete, south of Greece, after I had seen the site. And that morning, in the meditation, the complete drawing, which is over here on the light table, came to my mind. And it comes complete. So it's very interesting how it all works. It is not something that is controlled. It's something I have to open my psyche to, and then the idea arrives. You know, it just comes into me. The same way your ideas must come for the video work. It's a, it's a very interesting process that I've learned to trust. Okay. Um, besides the uh, bureaucracy of the paperwork, please tell me how long um, you take uh, to finish a piece of sculpture from start to finish? Well, it doesn't take very long for me to uh, visit the site if we're going to take out all the paperwork of doing public sculpture. For me to visit a site, to photograph it, to measure it, and to sit with the space takes one day. And my film is in my hands in two hours. And for me to design, sometimes the intuition process, the arrival of the message or whatever the image is, can take one week. But never more. And that could take less. It could take one hour. It could take one day. But usually I make some sketches and I meditate and I make some sketches and I meditate and then all of a sudden the whole thing is arriving. It's like having a, a birth, but it comes from I don't know where. And um, 
That does not take long, but the thing that is crucial, that is different in every sculpture is how much the chaos there is in my life. If my life is calm, if I am serene, now with the windows closed in the studio, it's very quiet in here, it's very nice. But if I have a lot of interruptions from different things, which is easy to have happen in New York, in New York City, then it's more difficult for me to become meditative and to have the message arrive. So it may take a week to get the message for the design. If it's calm, I can find the message in one or two days by being calm and meditating on the materials, which as I say are the sight, the measurements, the temperature, the sun. Um, and one of the basic essential things I do during that meditation process is I ask myself, what is missing in this place? What is it that this place does not have that it needs? Because the work I'm doing is healing. And I go to the site and I say, what do we need here? At Smith Houses in Chinatown, what was needed was a sense of connection because the Hispanic and the Chinese people are very different. And I wanted to build a sculpture that would tell everyone Hispanic, Chinese, Yemenese, Indian, there are all sorts of people there, but the basic two population groups are Hispanic and Chinese. I wanted to share that the Hispanic and the Chinese come from the same earth. So what was needed, what would be healing, was orbital connector. So that's how I've been working. Mm, like, um, can you tell me like, how long do you take a sculpture to a factory uh, to... Well, that part can take a little longer. My process of the design may take one week. So then I'm finished with the design. Then I take my design to a fabricator. And depending upon uh, the fabrication schedule, sometimes the fabricator will be able to work immediately. For instance, the piece in Philadelphia was built in one day because it is a wooden deck and a man who built it is a, a, you know, a deck builder. So he began immediately and within one day it was finished. Uh, in uh, Tampa where this tower is, it's a tower called Towers in the Lighthouse, they built that sculpture in Kentucky for me and a fabrication uh, operation which builds a lot of steeples and clock towers. It took them six weeks. But the process that goes on between my week of design and the six weeks of fabrication with the fabricator is my giving them my design and then they send me back their drawings and tell me that they want to build it this way and I send their drawings back and I say, but this is too big, this is too little, change that curve. So we go back and forth until the drawings are absolutely perfect in my mind. Then we submit them to an engineer who says they're absolutely perfect or need correction because of structural issues. And then we send them to, so then you're getting into the paperwork, you see, so it, it we're not, the, the process I'm talking about right now is, is uh, partly paperwork and partly design. Because after the, I draw it and the fabricator does shop drawings and the engineer approves the shop drawings, then all of that becomes a package that goes to the agency which is commissioning me. And then you get into more paperwork, politics. <laughs> Um, how important do you think a sculpture is for the people? Well, I think that uh, sculpture is, uh, particularly the kind I do, the public sculpture is very important because uh, it is on exhibit for 24 hours a day. So it makes it very different from artwork which is in a museum or artwork which is in a private collection or artwork which is in a gallery. Everyone in Smith Houses can go out and climb on or play with or walk around orbital connector anytime, day or night. So that makes it very special. And uh, the reason artwork itself is very important uh, for people is because it expands the perception of the person who is around the artwork. In other words, if it's good artwork, there's a lot of bad artwork out there, but the good artwork will cause a person who's watching it, whether it's the artwork of your video or whether it's the artwork of my sculpture or whatever, it will cause the person who is near that artwork to think again and feel again about his life and his world and her, or her world and think differently. 
And so I call that the expansion of perception, which is necessary if it's good artwork. How many sculpture currently in New York? I have two permanent installations in New York City, the or a vaulted arbor, which is in that model there, and uh, orbital connector in Chinatown. Okay. Um, how do you feel about your sculpture being used for recreational purposes and parks? It's wonderful because um, when I design the sculpture, as I say, I go to the site, and if the site is a park or a place where young people or children will play on the sculpture, I design it so it's strong enough for that. Okay. And safe. Okay. What is the theme of your work, Orbital Connector? How did you come up with this idea? Well, forget about the last part. Just yeah. Understand. Yeah, the last part we talked about, uh, I, about how the Orbital Connector idea came. Some things I didn't say earlier were that in my looking at the site, uh, of Smith Houses in the back mall, I researched what that site was historically, which I always do whenever I'm at a site. And historically, that was the old port of New York. And clipper ships pulled up right there to the dock. And in the 1600s, this country was not yet settled, but there was a wonderful old navigation device that was designed, I think I'm accurate on that date, uh, called an armillary. And it has a sphere, and through it, an arrow passes. And this is, I think, an Italian navigational device. And this device never worked so well, but they tried to use it to reckon and find their way around the Earth using the stars and this device. But it's a pretty image, sculpturally. So since that's the old port of New York, I took that image of the armillary, and instead of having the arrow just traverse the sphere slightly, I had the arrow go through the sphere like this. So the arrow becomes much bigger in relationship to the sphere. And in orbital connector, the sphere is 9 feet in diameter, and the arrow is 42 feet long. So uh, there were that t the two elements of the design. The concern for the community, because the work is not just site-specific, it's community-specific, and the concern for the history of the site. Okay. Um. How important is the tenant's reaction to your work? 